Well, thank you, dear friends. Please stand. Well, this is a great joy for Louise and me to be here. Um, 1977 seems an awful long time ago, and uh, I'm rather glad it's a different time of year. January, uh, it was quite chilly. Um, I made the mistake of walking down, I was staying in Evanston, of walking down towards the lake with the wind behind me. And so I didn't realize I was quite so cold until I turned around to walk back again. And my ears nearly dropped off, so I promptly brought myself a, a fur hat, which I still have. And I've only used it once since, and that was when one winter Louise and I visited Romania, and our daughter was doing a year of service there, and it came in very handy in Romania. <laughs> uh, the temple, of course, is so beautiful now. It's uh, cleaning and things have gone on since uh, I was last here. It was marvelous then because I remember coming down the same road and it was, in, it, it, it was in the dark and the temple was floodlit and it was covered in snow. So my first visit to, to the temple was also a magical experience and I'm so glad that Louise had a similar one at a, at a different time of year. Now when uh, the reason for our coming to, to uh, the United States was to attend the ABS conference in um, uh, Seattle. Uh, it was the first ABS conference either of us have ever been to, either the North American one or any other ABS conference in the world. And it came up sort of as a last minute idea. And uh, we had a few days left over from our holiday of the previous year and thought this was too great an opportunity to miss, both to uh, attend the conference and also give me a chance to bring Louise to Wilmette to see the National Center. So our plan was that on our way back from Seattle, we'd sort of sneak into Wilmette and uh, visit the temple, and perhaps if there was a fireside on, attend a fireside. But um, then that didn't work out quite that way, and I was asked to, <laughs> to speak to all your wonderful friends. So I was wondering what to uh, talk about, and uh, it occurred to me that um, some words about the, the question of, or the subject of interpretation could uh, come in handy. By the way, can you all hear me with the fans and things? Okay, good. No? Oh. So I'll try to be a bit louder, shall I? Does that manage work? No? Oh. Fans, okay. I'll try to be even louder. <laughs> um, the, uh, there is, of course, various meanings to the word interpretation, and I think this is one of the things we have to learn in the faith, to understand that the same word has many different meanings. Language is a poor thing when compared with what God wants to tell us. If you try to put yourself in the place of a manifestation of God, coming to this world with the knowledge that's needed to take mankind forward a whole thousand years in its evolution, and then having to explain that to people in their own language. It wouldn't help to use another language because we wouldn't understand a thing. So he has to use the tools that we can benefit from to convey these incredible truths to us. And he does it with the greatest divinely guided skill one can imagine. So we must beware of wishing that he'd been more simple. Now, there's a story uh, from many years ago of the great dancer Pavlova. And she had just danced, some magnificent dance, and someone asked her to explain in a few words what she had meant to convey by this dance. And she said, if I could have explained it in a few words, I would not have gone to the trouble of dancing it. <laughs> this, I think, is what we must bear in mind when we're reading the writings. Baha'u'llah is not being uh, purposely obscure or purposely complicated. He is doing the best he possibly can to get incredible truths through our thick skulls. 
and he has to use uh, the words at his disposal. Now this, of course, uh, applies in general to, to our own thinking about the revelation about anything, to use our own minds in trying to work out what it is that's trying to be conveyed to us. Um, there's been a change in the use of language uh, in the past few decades. And it's a very significant one. Uh, when I was young, when you wanted to try to understand what someone was telling you, you said, what are you getting at? Nowadays, one tends to say, where are you coming from? And it's a very significant difference. The first question is concentrated on the essence of what the person is trying to explain. The second one looks right past what he's trying to explain to try and understand why he's saying it. Now that's not a wholly bad, but it does rather imply that he's not in control of his own speech. That something in his makeup is what causes him to say that. I think we must remember not only to work out where the person's coming from, but what is he trying to get at? Above all, when we're reading the writings and studying the writings of, of the Shoghi Effendi. Now there is, of course, a, a hierarchical uh, level between uh, interpretation, the authoritative interpretation of the Guardian, and the authoritative legislation of the Universal House of Justice. Inevitably, because the word is the supreme authority in the faith. And the guardian, or Abdul Baha, the interpreter, is the voice of that word. So the guardian, in one of the functions of the guardian, is to uh, define the sphere of the legislative action of the Universal House of Justice. Now we should not make the mistake of thinking that without the guardian in being here, the House of Justice will therefore step outside its area of jurisdiction. Because the Guardian himself has written that neither the Guardian nor the Universal House of Justice ever can or will infringe on this jurisdiction of the other. What I think it can mean is that there are areas where the House of Justice might have been able to legislate, where now it won't, because it isn't 100% sure. It can't say to the Guardian, is this within our area of jurisdiction? So the House of Justice may hold back from making decisions in areas where, if we had a Guardian with it, he said, yes, go on, go ahead. And I'll give you an example of this. As you know, in both Christianity and the Baha'i faith, uh, murder is prohibited. The question then arises as to whether abortion and euthanasia are permissible or not. Now the Roman Catholic Church has quite definitely decided that both come under the heading of murder. It's impossible. What would we have done in the Baha'i faith in looking at that question? Fortunately, the Guardian has interpreted both issues. On August the 25th, 1939, he wrote, and these, by the way, are a series of interpretations on which the House of Justice had to build. He said, the practice of abortion, which is absolutely criminal, as it involves deliberate destruction of human life, is forbidden in the cause. Regarding mercy killings, this is also a matter which the Universal House of Justice will have to legislate upon. Now, that's a very interesting complication or combination of things. He says abortion's prohibited, but he also has it as one of the things the House of Justice has to legislate on. Then on the 13th of November, 1940, he says, regarding the practice of abortion, as no specific reference has been made to the subject in the writings of Baha'u'llah, it devolves upon the International House of Justice to definitely pronounce upon it. There can be no doubt, however, that this practice, involving as it does the destruction of human life, is to be strongly deprecated. 
Then, in, on the 20th of October, 1953, as there is nothing specific in the Baha'i writings on the subject of abortion, it will consequently have to be dealt with by the International House of Justice when that body is formed. Now, this is a very interesting combination of three interpretative statements. And you might say that because he's left it to the House of Justice, okay, that's the final decision. But the earlier uh, interpretations are like soul-shaking hints to the House of Justice as to the way the wind's blowing. <laughs> Now, so the House of Justice had to examine these interpretations and its ruling was that to have an abortion just for the sake of getting rid of an unwanted birth is absolutely forbidden. But that there may be cases in which abortion would be permissible. Uh, and it's become clear later that these are medical cases the House is thinking about. And this is for the House of Justice to legislate on. Appending such legislation, the decision is left to the consciences of the individuals concerned in the light of the above principles and of expert medical advice. Now you see how this is a, a progression of quite, of quite clear uh, legislative decision uh, in an area which is of very uh, intimate human concern but which also depends very greatly, not merely on knowledge of the teachings, but on scientific understanding, on medical advice. Now, another area concerns the obligatory prayers. In the 13th Glad Tidings, Baha'u'llah states, all matters of state should be referred to the House of Justice, but acts of worship must be observed according to that which God hath revealed in his book. And on one of the occasions, one occasion, one of the believers wrote to the House of Justice and asked it to designate a prayer which could be said for the Universal House of Justice because we had a prayer for the Guardian, you know. And on that occasion, the House of Justice referred to this text and said that it is impossible for the House of Justice to answer this sort of question, that he couldn't designate a prayer for itself. But you might have thought also that anything to do with the obligatory prayers would also have been beyond the jurisdiction of the House of Justice, except that the Guardian had written that matters of detail that are obscure in the obligatory prayers are for the Universal House of Justice to rule on. So you see what I mean by saying there may be areas the House wouldn't go into, which if you had a guardian, we'd have said, yeah, okay. Uh, in this case, for example, in the obligatory prayers, what happened many years ago was that the National Assembly, by the way, can you hear in the back? Okay? Yeah. National Assembly of the Near East asked two questions. Uh, you know, in one of the, uh, the uh, prayers, it says, raise your hands twice and say, then you have a verse. And the question was, um, does this mean you have to say the whole verse each time you raise your hands, or do you raise your hands twice and then say the verse? And um, the House of Justice, there's a similar question about ablutions for the obligatory prayers. And uh, I think on these two questions, the House of Justice spent about two years before it made a decision. Because it got all the texts, consulted them, all the interpretations of the Guardian. Uh, it was quite complex because remember, when Baha'u'llah revealed the Kitab al-Aqdas, he revealed it in the light of the prayer of um, 19, uh, what do you call it, Rakats. And then after he'd revealed the Kitab al-Aqdas, he revealed new obligatory prayers. So what reveals to which, you know, what relates to which? So the House of Justice discussed all this. Uh, got a whole series of Baha'i scholars to make their opinions, discussed them too, arrived at what it thought would be the correct answer, and sent this back to the scholars and to the International Teaching Center in those days and asked for their reactions. Once it got all their reactions, it examined them all again and then made its decision. 
Now, on the, those two questions, in relation to the raise your hands twice and say, the House of Justice said that you can do one of two things. You can raise your hands twice and then recite the whole verse. Or, if you notice, that particular verse begins with two introductory phrases. So you can raise your hands once for one of the introductory phrases and then raise them again for the rest of the verse. It's up to the individual to decide. In regard to the ablutions, the House of Justice decided that you should have ablutions before the long and the short and the medium ob obligatory prayer, but that the words of the verse are only compulsory for the medium prayer. Now, these are quite minor things about praying. Everybody, I mean, people have been praying the obligatory prayers for years without knowing the answers. Um, but it shows how in, it, the Guardian has made it possible for the House to explain things in that area. Uh, now, that's a side issue, you might say, the relationship of um, inspired legislation and the interpretation of the Guardian. What I really wanted to talk about was to give illustrations of the way in which Shoghi Effendi exercised his function of interpreter. And I'll give you some examples. There's the passage in the will, you remember, where Abdul Baha urges the friends to take the greatest care of Shoghi Effendi. And someone asked a question about that. And he said, the answer was, in regards to your questions, what the master meant in the words you quoted, is simply that joy gives one more freedom to create. If the prophets, the master himself and the guardian, had less problems and worries, they could give forth a great deal more creatively to the cause. When he said that, grow to be as a fruitful tree, he meant that by lifting burdens from the guardian, and trying as much as possible to do our share of the work of the faith, we would help Shoghi Effendi to develop his full powers as guardian, and through the covenant, the cause would spread its shadow over all men. This we have seen happen in the last 30 years, but that does not mean we must not try to our utmost to help him by our lives and our services. That was written in 1952. Then there's another ta place where Abdul Baha in one of his tablets refers to the room, you know, mucus in the head. And someone asked about that. And the Guardian's secretary answered on his behalf in 1950, the room mentioned in the tablet of the master is symbolic. He means that the people have a spiritual cold and cannot smell the divine fragrance and that the believers must be the physicians to heal men of these conditions. He is not referring to, to physical ailments. Then another question. This was uh, answered in 1950. It's one of the, questioning one of the, the meaning of one of the passages used by the master. It says, the master uses this term, quote, the divine reality is sanctified from singleness, unquote, in order to forcibly impress us with the fact that the Godhead is unknowable and that to define it is impossible. We cannot contain it in such concepts as singleness and plurality, which we apply to things we know and can experience. He uses the method of exaggerated emphasis in order to drive home his thought that we know the sun indirectly through its rays the Godhead indirectly through the manifestation of God. Then another passage in Gleanings that refers to the soul as being a harbinger of the next world. He says the human soul is a harbinger in the sense that it gives us a faint idea of the existence of other worlds, an inkling of the spiritual worlds beyond. Then another image that Baha'u'llah uses in the Tablet of Ahmad. This was written in um, 1955. It says, the flame of fire, you know, be a flame of fire to my enemies. The flame of fire in the tablet of Ahmad should be taken figuratively. In other words, we must not tolerate the evil of covenant breakers or enemies of the faith, but be uncompromising in our loyalty, in our exposure of them, 
and in our defense of the faith. Then there's another passage where Baha'u'llah refers to the faculties of sight and hearing. And this was in 1922. What Baha'u'llah means by the faculty of sight and hearing is a physical faculty, not a spiritual abstraction. He means that we have been given eyes and ears to appreciate what goes on in this world by Almighty God. In other words, we can read the teachings and listen to the message of the Prophet. This is to be taken literally. And then another expression in Gleanings 70, page 70. So the expression in Gleanings page 70, quote, him who is at the distance of two bows, unquote, should not be taken literally, but it has an allegorical meaning indicating nearness or close proximity. Then in 1937, there's a passage in the Hidden Words, which will be familiar to you. It says, Hidden Words, Persian, Persian section. The expression, tend my raven locks and not wound my throat. You know, it's about the comb, Baha'u'llah speaks of the comb, was given you to tend his raven locks, not to wound his throat. It's an allegorical warning by Baha'u'llah against the misuse of anything bestowed on him in the world. It's bestowed by him, sorry, on the world. Now then, uh, in the, there's a reference the Guardian made to the Kalimati Fedosia, the words of paradise. He quotes what Baha'u'llah says there. We have formally ordained that people should converse in two languages, yet efforts must be made to reduce them to one. Likewise, the scripts of the world, that men's lives may not be dissipated and wasted in learning divers' languages. Thus, the whole earth would come to be regarded as one city and one land. So one of the believers wrote and said, how does this relate to Baha'u'llah's injunction to have an international auxiliary language in addition to one's native language? And the Guardian answered through his secretary in 1946, what Baha'u'llah is referring to in the eighth leaf of the exalted paradise is a far distant time when the world is really one country and one language would be a sensible possibility. It does not contradict his instructions as to the need immediately for an auxiliary language. Now, the interesting thing about these specific ones is to realize how many ways the Guardian uses in interpreting the scriptures. Uh, we only, not only learn what the specific passages mean, but we receive an object lesson in studying the writings. We see that some passages are to be taken literally, others allegorically, some are even stylistic exaggerations to produce an intended effect, and some relate to a different stage in the development of the dispensation than do others. So we should not only remember what the Guardian said in these particular cases, but these facts about the revelation, we must bear in mind when studying them, what's meant, what, what is Baha'u'llah doing here? And the same thing, I think, relates also to the instructions of the Guardian and the instructions of the House of Justice, that one should think, how does this uh, affect me? Because sometimes a, a number of the um, requests and so on sent out from the World Center which are questions to the whole world, obviously relate only to one country or to certain countries and not to others. And we're trying hard to overcome this problem and, as it were, tailor the requests to different national assemblies. But I remember in uh, the uh, statistical reports some years ago, national assemblies were asked to report how many tribes were represented in their country. And we had a rather touching letter from the National Assembly of Greece saying that they had a couple of pioneers from Ghana or Ethiopia and they were to belong to this tribe and that tribe, but they were sorry, that's all they had. <laughs> but of course the House of Justice wasn't thinking of Greece when it was asking for the names of tribes. And uh, one should, should uh, realize that. So when, <laughs> and when the House of Justice encourages one thing, it doesn't mean drop everything else. Uh, we were in Sweden, for example, the reason I on holiday. Our son was living in Sweden then. And uh, we had a meeting with the friends to discuss the introduction of training institutes. 
And uh, they had a very interesting series of study of deepening going on in the south of Sweden, which was were succeeding very well. And the friends came in a very puzzled look and said, does this mean we must now give up all that and just stop deepening and only have training institutes? They said, well, of course not. The fact that the House of Justice is introducing training institutes, it is introducing a particular type of activity which is desperately needed in the Baha'i community, it doesn't say drop everything else. The, the community grows as a human being grows. And as it grows, it starts new lines of action, new areas of activity. And those which are going well should keep on going well. But when the House of Justice introduces a new line of activity, it's drawing attention to this need a new, there's a new, a new quality, a new something needed in the Baha'i community. And this is now being introduced. And you have to find a way to do this as well as the other things. Now, it may over, take over some other things, but not necessarily. But this is, is always a, um, a difficulty. Human beings have a tendency to oscillate from one extreme to the other. And if you read the Guardian's letters over the whole of his guardianship, and indeed the letters of the House of Justice since 1963, you'll find that many of them are simply pulling the believers back from one extreme to the middle, as a result of which they shoot off in this direction, so it pulls them back again to the middle there, and they shoot off in this direction. This is a regular pattern. It's not just the Baha'is, human beings do that. Um, so this is one of the bounties of divine guidance in the faith, that it can keep the cause on a, you say, an even keel, and not continually tack backwards and forwards. Now, um, there are, of course, matters in which the Guardian refused to give interpretation at all. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples of this. He says, uh, we have no way of knowing what science Baha'u'llah meant when he said it would largely eliminate fear, as no further mention of it was ever made in the teachings, the Guardian cannot identify anything with this statement. To do so would be to depart from his function as interpreter of the teachings. He cannot reveal anything apart from the given teachings. Then, concerning the points you mention in the Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, page 32, these were never, so far as we know, further elaborated by Baha'u'llah. They remained hidden within the realms of his infinite knowledge, just as did the universal language which in that same book he mentions. And then lastly, as to your question regarding the possibility of an artificial production of life by means of an incubator, this is essentially a matter that concerns science and as such should be investigated and studied by scientists. So the Guardian didn't just sort of pull out of the air a nice answer to any difficult question. He was interpreting the writings, not revealing. And again and again, by the way, in the same way, he used to stress that he wasn't prophesying. When he spoke about the future, he was indicating tendencies and trends and reading the signs of the times. So don't get upset if something you read in one letter of the Guardian is contradicted by something he said later. And there's a letter, I think, way back, where he said that the Mashrikal Azkar for Mount Carmel would be the third Mashrikal Azkar in the Baha'i world. You have Eshkabad, this one, and the one on Mount Carmel. But we've got lots of magical as cars now, and there's still no sign of the one in Mount Carmel being built. We have the design, we have it already, we have the land, but this is not the time to build a magical as car in Mount Carmel. Um, there's another aspect of the Guardian's writings which I think is, is um, very beautiful. And it's, it's not just interpreting the words of a thing. It's giving, uh, going beyond the, ca the passage in question. And the one that I think is very touching is about the um, uh, meaning of the short obligatory prayer. Uh, someone, Mr. Lacey, asked a question about this. And uh, he says, the meaning of the short prayer mentioned by Mr. Lacey in his letter is simply that Baha'u'llah has put into one brief sentence the very essence of life, which is that we come from one Father and pass on the road of life through tests and trials and experiences so that our souls may grow 
and the reason for our existence is to learn to know and understand our Creator. As we do this, we will increase our love for Him and will worship Him. This is really the deepest joy that comes to any soul. All others are merely reflections of this happiness, the happiness that comes when we worship the God who made us, our Heavenly Father. Now that, I don't know whether you call that an interpretation or a commentary, but it's a wonderful expression of the guardian's insight into the meaning of the short obligatory prayer. And then again, sometimes the guardian would develop an entire massive con concept from one phrase in the writings. Uh, for example, there are two terms in the writings, the Namus Akbar, which means the greater law, and the Namus Azam, the most great law. These just appear in the writings. And the guardian said that the Namus Akbar, the greater law, is the constitution of the National Spiritual Assemblies, which is a wonderful honor for the National Assembly of the United States because it was that House of Justice that the Guardian guided in codifying the, the National Baha'i Constitution, the Declaration of Trust and Bylaws of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States is the codification of this law, which is a pattern for the entire Baha'i world, just as the local assembly, I think it is of New York, is the codified local uh, constitution for all local spiritual assemblies. And then he said also that the Musa Azam, the most great law, is the constitution of the Universal House of Justice. Now you see with these are colossal um, administrative and governance uh, prone uh, concepts, which he drew from these two words, these two phrases in the writings. Um, and of course, there were also ways in which the Guardian uh, limited the uh, sphere of his own uh, authority in interpretation. Uh, and you've seen that, I think, he says, uh, where is it? Yes, he says, Shoghi Effendi is infallible only when interpreting the words. He considers it heretic to attribute to him a station equal to Baha'u'llah or even to the Master. His station is guardian of the cause of God and the president of the House of Justice and the interpreter of the words and nothing more. He absolutely disclaims any other station that the friends may, through their great love, wrongly attribute to him. So the guardian's personal powers are not unlimited and are different from those possessed by the master. But the degree of guidance which God may choose to vouchsafe him is unlimited as it comes from Baha'u'llah and not himself. Any extraordinary manifestation of knowledge or intuition he might on some occasions demonstrate must not be attributed to his possession of powers akin to, uh, akin to the Master's, but rather to a manifestation of the will of Baha'u'llah guiding him for his own reasons on that occasion. The Guardian is infallible interpreter of the Word of God his words are not the word of God itself, but his interpretation is as binding as the word. Now, you know there are cases when the guardian would, uh, as it were, in the course of his work, uh, show these extraordinary uh, extra powers, which used to impress people no end. Um, but as he's saying, it's not, this is not his inherent power. It's when the Baha'u'llah needs to guide him, he guides him. There's um, a case of one national assembly that was very disturbed by disunity, and it wrote to the Guardian complaining about the activities of two of its members. And the Guardian wrote, Guardian wrote back and told the National Assembly to instruct Mr. So-and-so, who was not one of these two, to correct his conduct. And what was happening was this particular member was, as it were, inciting each of the others against one another. Uh, then there's another occasion which the friends who were in Haifa remember when the Guardian came into the room one day furious, waving a letter saying, he's lying, he's lying. And then they realized the letter was un unopened. <laughs> uh, so there are, there are signs that the Guardian showed in here, but we, uh, you shouldn't think therefore the Guardian is omniscient or omnipotent. Uh, the similar thing happens with the House of Justice. There are cases when the House of Justice is obviously being guided by God to do something which is not normally within its um, 
you may say, sphere as the legislature of the faith. There was a case, sometimes you can put it down simply to uh, its studying of the subject, sometimes not. On one occasion, I remember the House of Justice had, had was studying a particular problem, and all nine members were quite happy about the, what we were th thinking of deciding. And that was the evening. And uh, there was no disagreement, but one member suddenly said, let's wait till tomorrow morning before we make this final decision. So we said, okay, well, it wasn't a rush. So the House waited till the next day, and when the meeting opened the next morning, uh, information had received overnight, which completely changed the picture of the decision taken the previous night. Now, therefore, don't think from that the House of Justice is, om is omniscient. The Guardian wrote himself that the Guardian likes to be given information from the friends. He says he likes to be provided with facts by the friends when they ask his advice. For although his decisions are guided by God, he is not, like the prophet, omniscient at will, in spite of the fact that he often senses a situation or condition without having any detailed knowledge of it. So, and he says also, anything that is not in the teachings, the guardian does not pass upon. These are matters for scientists and specialists. In the same way, the House of Justice's guidance is limited in certain areas by the um, uh, will and testament of Abba Baha and by the interpretations of the Guardian. But I think in, in certain areas, like in, as in the case of the Guardian, in the protection of the faith, Baha'u'llah protects his cause by guiding the institution at its center. Um, this happens, for example, in the case, I think, of declaration of, of covenant breaking. Uh, there was a case which is a wonderful thing happened. You know, in, in the Guardian's lifetime, the covenant breaking in the Holy Land uh, began to spread from the Holy Family, began to spread outward to other places in the Middle East. And uh, the situation became really poisonous. And the Guardian had to, had to um, quarantine certain places in the Middle East. And he said if he hadn't done that, this covenant breaking would have spread to Persia and destroyed the cause in Persia. And there were two towns particularly that he cordoned off. One was Beirut and one was Iskanderun in Turkey. And when I became a Baha'i, those were two towns no Baha'i was allowed to set foot in on pain of breaking the covenant. Uh, they, they were different into two towns. Beirut was a complete mishmash of covenant breakers, shaky Baha'is, and very strong staunch Baha'is. Iskanderun was entirely filled with covenant breakers because at one point the Guardian had in Iskandarun instructed the friends that every, all true Baha'is must leave Iskandarun. Whoever remains has broken the covenant. So they remained there. Now in the early years of the House of Justice it received a lot of letters from the Baha'is of Iskandarun repenting their covenant breaking. So it asked Mr. Furatan to go to Iskandarun and see each one of the Baha'is there, everyone who had written, and come back to tell the House of Justice whether he uh, accepted their repentance as being sincere repentance. And so he went. You can't, you can't do a thing like that in our mass. He went and met with every one of the Baha'is uh, as far as he could in Iskandarun and came back and reported to the House of Justice that he was satisfied that these Baha'is were repentant. There was one letter from one of the Baha'is that the House of Justice felt uneasy about. So it asked Mr. Can Mr. Furutan, did you really understand this Baha'i to have uh, repented? He said, as a matter of fact, I wasn't able to see him. He was away from Iskandarun at the time but his mother and the other Baha'is assured me that he was as repentant as they were. So the House of Justice asked him to go back to Iskandarun and see this Baha'i, or this person. And so he went and interviewed this person and found that what had happened was he'd said to other people at the time, ha, this House of Justice is no House of Justice. I'm going away. You just tell them what you like and they'll accept me back. And the House of Justice didn't. Um, now this, I think, is a protection of the faith, the, pr the protection the faith has 
in very serious cases like this. In Beirut, there was a, a wonderful outcome because the situation as I, in Beirut, as I mentioned, was very mixed. And the House of Justice asked an auxiliary board member from Morocco, Abdullah Mesbah, to please go to Beirut, try and sort out who are the loyal Baha'is, deepen them, and report back about the condition of the community. And later it asked two other Baha'is, a Mr. Adel Parrar and a Mr. Zahrai, to join him. In later years, Mr. Zahrai, alas, was kidnapped by terrorists, and we don't know what happened to him. But these three very devoted Baha'is went to Beirut and sorted out that situation. And they were able, a number of the former covenant breakers repented, the loyal Baha'is stood up loyally, and the remaining covenant breakers were clear they were out of the faith. And that was the beginning of the revivification of the whole cause, not only in Beirut, but in Lebanon and the surrounding country. And now, as you know now, we have a very strong national assembly in the Lebanon, in Beirut. So these were things that happened and gave the House of Justice great joy in the early years of its existence. That these two centers of, of dis disaffection, you might say, were, in other words, brought, brought back into the cause. In, a, in a Skanderun, it's a very strong local assembly in, in Turkey now, and the Baha'is have gone around, their families have spread, and the, the whole smear of covenant breaking has gone. Um, so this, this is a thing we must bear in also, mind also when we are uh, thinking of what the House of Justice instructs. Try to understand what it means, and also bear in mind that you can't be too, um, shall we say, legalistic about whether or not you should obey it. The Guardian said the same thing. He says, um, uh, without such an institution as the guardianship, the means required to enable the faith to take a long... Oh, sorry, that's not the one, sorry. Um, where are we? Um, Yeah, I can't find it, but I'll tell you what it is. Anyway, he, he, the point he makes in this is that uh, the Guardian isn't, uh, obviously, he, he, gives, he is different in his, uh, what he says. He says if he gives an instruction, the Baha'is must obey it, whether it's an interpretation or not. If he instructs, he must be obeyed. But if he gives advice, it's exactly what he says. It's advice. And the believer should decide whether or not he'll follow it. And the same thing happens with the House of Justice. Uh, and I've heard friends say, well, if the House of Justice advises you, I mean, that's as good as a command. But it isn't. The House of Justice can speak the English language. If it wants to instruct, it instructs. If it wants to advise, it advises. And one of the reasons is that when a person has a personal issue, there are so many factors that affect it. That person's own condition, his livelihood, his family, all sorts of things which the House of Justice can't possibly get a complete report on. So the House of Justice looks at the situation and considers the, the various factors, the point of view of the faith, the point of view of the person, and then gives its advice as to what it seems the course he could follow. But it understands this person has other knowledge which he doesn't have. And he should use that knowledge and decide wisely what he thinks is the right course to follow in light of that advice. Um, so take the, the, the wording of the House of Justice to be what it seems to mean. Uh, if the House of Justice really wants to give a command, it'll give it. It tries not to, too often. <laughs> uh, there was a case back when the persecutions were starting in Iran, when the, uh, some of the Persian Baha'is in one of the communities of Europe were getting very agitated about Khomeini and were beginning to act strongly in support of the Shah and his uh, followers. And this was extremely dangerous for the Baha'is in Iran. And that's the only occasion which I remember where the House of Justice wrote to Baha'is, and he wrote to these Baha'is in this case, or he wrote to the National Assembly and told it to give instruction, Tell these friends they must under no circumstances get involved in this political question. If they do, they are spiritually excommunicated from the faith. Uh, normally the House of Justice doesn't go that far, but it was leaving no doubt that this was an instruction, not advice. 
But when it gives advice, it gives advice. Um, now, there's a very interesting uh, comment in the dispensation about another function of the Guardian. This is the one I began reading a couple of minutes ago. He says, in the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi wrote that without such an institution as the guardianship, the means required to enable the faith to take a long and uninterrupted view over a series of generations would be completely lacking. Now, I've heard friends relate this statement to the fact that the guardianship is a hereditary institution and that it was this hereditary factor that would provide the means to the faith to take this long view. Now, I haven't seen any explanation in the Guardian's writings of this particular passage. But it seems to me that although um, uh, there is, of course, an element of truth in the assumption, the mere fact that each Guardian would have succeeded his father in office uh, does not seem an adequate basis for the exercise of such an exclusive function. The function of inspired interpreter, however, does imply it. As interpreter, the guardian is able to understand not only the outward meaning of the writings, but their inner implications. Although others, by studying the writings and the progress of human affairs, can gain some idea of the way society will develop, the guardian alone could clearly see the whole panorama of Baha'u'llah's intention and could delineate for us the course that the manifestation of God sees as lying before us. Uh, so this is done, in fact, in many of his writings, the World Order Letters and God Passes By. And God Passes By is not only a history book. It's a magnificent, uh, although a magnificent history book it is, it is also an inspired commentary on the events it recounts, illuminates the past, challenges us in the present, and gives us a vision of the future. Uh, but you can see this, this is the sort of thing that in a sense only the Guardian could do. And if you read uh, The Century of Light, which the House of Justice recently had written, you'll see the House of Justice is doing something else. In the World Order Letters, the Guardian is throwing out the future before us, in many ways alienating what's happening. What the House of Justice is doing in Century of Light is looking back at this past century and commenting on how this is seen according to the writings and the teachings of the faith. I don't think the House of Justice is ever going to write anything like the word or World Order Letters because it goes forward um, sort of blind in a sense, apart from what it's got from the Guardian and the Baha'u'llah and the Abu Baha. You know, I think the, the, the um, uh, Greeks it was who, who saw time as, or as history, as walking backwards. Now, as you look back at what you can see, you don't see where you're walking into. Now, we can because of what the Guardian did. So don't ever think that the Guardian's writings about the future of the faith are something that he wrote in 1932 and 1940s, and really those times are all past. These are the Guardian's legacy to us, to guide us into the future as we build the whole world order in centuries ahead. Now, the details we shall see as they unfold. How the administrative order evolves into the world order, uh, we shall see only as time passes and the House of Justice makes its decisions. So we mustn't be too impatient. Little by little, things will become clear, but the great vision has been given to us already by Shoghi Effendi. Thank you.